If you were with us last week, we ended right at the end of chapter 2 at verse 15 with this uh, type of slide by saying, can you imagine, because it's a very visual way of thinking the Old Testament, and you're supposed to imagine the prophet standing on the top of the mountain, Mount Zion, where the temple is, and he turns to all four points of the compass where the nations at those four points are, and he ended with the nation of Assyria, mainly through the city-state of Nineveh, which is northeast of Jerusalem. And he proclaimed a judgment upon that nation because of their complete and utter oppression of the nations around them. And by the words they said in verse 15, I am the one and there is none beside me. They are mocking the words that Isaiah himself said a hundred or so years earlier when the army who came to punish Israel was stopped at the door because they mocked God and Assyria was heard these words and they were mocked. They thought they were the gods, but God said back to them through Isaiah's words, there is only one God. But of course, that didn't make them stop. Over the next hundred years, they continued to invade the nations around them. And as they invaded, they continued to absolutely punish, to rip out the goods from those nations, to kill people, to put them into slavery, to the point where they said, well, a hundred years ago or so, your God said he was the one. Where is your God now? You may have thought that yourself. That God has helped you through good times, but then in tough times you say, where is God when I need him? Well, Israel started to say that. He was with us in the past, through the crossing of the Red Sea, through this, through that. Where is he now? And Assyria, through the nation there, said, well, I, I, how do I know this? Because I've been punishing the gods all around this world for decades. Where are their gods? There's about 1,100 kilometres by road from Nineveh to Jerusalem. And every nation along the journey said, we trusted our gods. And what happened to them? Latin. And so they say, we are the one. There is none beside me. What a ruin she has become, God promises but not yet a lair for wild beasts who pass by her, scoff and shake their fists. Now, the reason I mention this is because the NIV and all your Bibles has done a very helpful thing by telling you in advance what they want you to understand from the passage, which would, which would not have been there for the original hearers and readers of the text. That is, there are no chapter divisions in the original text, there are no verses, there is just writing, and there is no NIV heading that says Jerusalem at the top of your Bibles that tell you that. Which means, in the original reading, as you would have sat and listened, you hear the word, woe to the city of oppressors. What city? Well, Nineveh. It's the one just been spoken of in verse 15. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. And the whole idea is something you see quite regularly in literature, especially in the uh, Old Testament, and that is... You're supposed to imagine again, like that, like that person I said was standing on top of the Temple Mount and as they look out, they judge the world around them. If you want the best, longest example of this, Jeremiah does it for 20 chapters, basically saying, you're hopeless, you're hopeless, as he goes around the points of the compass. But what we have here is, it looks like at this stage that God is still talking about Nineveh. And of course, therefore, Jerusalem will be going, yes, Woe to those city of oppressors. They need a cop it. They've been smashing us for 150 years. We've been oppressed. They are rebellious against you, God. They are defiled pagans. She obeys no one. Yes, she does not. And as you look out through the window, you start to go, yes, I totally agree. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. They devour. There's only really... Two ways in the ancient world that invading nations used to operate, plunder or taxation. Plunder is short term, you just murder everybody who's, you know, old and decrepit or young and everybody else, you sell under slavery, you pinch their women, you pinch their goods or you stay there and you tax them to the hilt for the next hundred years. That was the Roman way. The Assyrian way was more the plunder, the roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets 
are unprincipled. They are treacherous people. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. So for the first four verses, it looks like that God is continuing this discussion upon those who are oppressing Israel, oppressing the church. And we would all go, yes, we agree. But then he does a bit of a switcheroo by actually showing them that he was never really, in chapter 3, talking about Nineveh at all. Verse 5, the Lord within her is righteous. You would go, the Lord ain't within Nineveh at all. And slowly he reveals that it wasn't through a window Zephaniah was looking, he was looking into a mirror. And these words weren't proclaimed against Assyria, chapter 3, they're proclaimed against you. So the whole idea becomes the same judgment you wished upon others, the same hatred that you have about others is true for you. You are an oppressor, you are rebellious, you are defiled. But the Lord within her is righteous. So if we have a righteous Lord and an unrighteous people, what's going to happen? Well, the unrighteous people are in trouble. And originally we went, yes, because they're Moab and Ammon and Philistia and St. Mary's and other people we know, maybe a person you'll see tomorrow at work who is a non-Christian, what gives you solace is that they're judged by the Lord, like Israel here. And God says, you're like them. You're like the people you judge. And so instead of looking out of the window, you're looking into a mirror. But as you look into the mirror, you not merely see yourself, you see God in the reflection. He is there. Verse 5, the Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning, he dispenses justice. And so you go from saying, yes, smash those pesky Assyrians to no, because that means he's smashing me. And every new day he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. He's talking about us. Now, initially, God had already said in chapter 1, there is two reasons why he brings judgment. The first is because of the unholiness of the Israelites, and the second is because of the unholiness of the nations. Israel, for not following their God and following the law, the nations for rejecting what it even means to be created in the image of God. But there's a third reason given in chapter 3, verses 6 to 8. But I want you also to think to yourself, why bother repeating the same type of information in chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, that he'd already said for a chapter in chapter 1. So chapter 1 is all about Israel is hopeless, Israel is defiled, Israel is an oppressor, it's rebellious, it deserves what it gets. And in chapter 2, he says, don't worry, Israel, the rest of the nations are just like you. And then in chapter 3, he goes back to saying, you're just like the nations. Why repeat the same info? Well, here's one reason, but there will be another of which see if you can get it as we go through. The first is in verse 6 through to 8. He says in verse 6, I have destroyed nations, their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted with no one passing through. Their cities are laid waste. They are deserted and empty. So basically, Assyria in 721 or so went home kicking and screaming after uh, their, their annihilation by Israel in a 605-ish type stuff. And so basically what we have in between those dates is Assyria being very, very upset. But they didn't just go home with their tails between their legs. They went home and then they came back in that 1,100 kilometres in between Nineveh and Jerusalem. And they wiped out every other nation in between more than once because they got to Israel's doorstep in 721 by annihilating everybody else in between. Then they go home, you know, Sennacherib, if you've read the text in Isaiah, goes home with his tail between his legs as God's knocked off his entire army, goes home, he gets home, his uh, children knock him off, you know, it's obviously had dysfunctional household, children knock him off, new king comes on the board, and then they slowly make their way for the next hundred years uh, back towards killing Israel. But before it happens, Babylon come and pump them in about 626, and they take over the job. So what does that mean? It means for the hundred years, Israel wasn't safe. It had always had death at its door, judgment on its doorstep. 
and the nations in between Jerusalem and Babylon, or Nineveh, which is up the road, had always controlled that 1,100 kilometres in between. These nations had been destroyed, looted. Why? Well, God gives us one reason. You've heard the other one a couple of weeks ago, God's judgment upon those who worship idols. But here's another one. Of Jerusalem, I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. In other words, if you saw the nation who's at war with all the other nations coming towards you, wouldn't you say, Lord, help me? Lord, save me? Wouldn't you ask the Lord for help? In other words, God could have judged Israel, bang. Didn't need to wait 100 years. He could have just judged them. Didn't need to give them a a long period of time to repent, but he did. And one of those ways of repentance was the slow marauding Assyrian army, which got replaced by the Babylonian army in 626. Why? Because the threat of annihilation should have sent them back to the Lord who could save. Because he's telling them, don't try and save yourself by your own strength. How's that going for the other nations? There's 1,100 kilometres of wasteland. And you think you're going to be different by supporting yourself by your own strength? I've given you this time for correction. But what did you do? Well, you were eager to act corruptly in all you did. In other words, you did not pay attention to my correction. You did not pay attention to my grace. You took my grace as complacency. Remember chapter 1? You thought I wasn't going to come and judge you. You thought every time that I gave you help, it was me being a coward or weak. I'm giving you a chance. Before verse 8, therefore wait for me. But he's not waiting now, God, for love. It's justice. I've given you time. As you wait for me, declares the Lord, for that day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms, and to pour out my wrath on them. Now, that doesn't sound real positive, does it? And Israel is part of these nations now. My fierce anger, the whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. So, in other words, Israel, God's people, all humans are in the same boat. It doesn't matter. No end of me giving you chances has changed a thing. No end of me giving you the law has made a difference. I send nations as a warning, you don't change. I send nations as judgment, you don't get in fear and bow down before me and ask for help. You try and fight the battle yourselves, even though every other nation has done that, has been obliterated by the Babylonians or Assyrians. We fight our own battles, thinking that we can be different from the previous person who's fought a battle. And God says nonsense but ask yourself this question why is there verse 9 at all why isn't it just shut the book god you gave it a good shot created humanity you've stuffed it up it's now time for humanity 2.0 why not just pull the pin i've given you guys so many opportunities the whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger i'm starting again Why is there a verse 9? Why isn't it, now pull the pin, start again, or pull the pin, you know, God, I'm going to enjoy a lot more time in heaven with the Son, the Lord Jesus, and the Spirit, and all these angels. I don't need this mess called earth. I don't need it. I don't need the trouble. I don't want to look upon sin. Turn the news on tonight. Do you want to look upon that for the next million years? He's been looking on it ever since he created you, Adam and Eve. Why not pull the pin, start again? Because it looks like he's pulling the pin and there is no need to start again. Verse 8. The world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Why is there verse 9? Verse 9. Then. Now, if I was God, I would then say, then I will go home to heaven, have a cup of tea with the angels who don't sin, and enjoy the rest of the millennia plus and just forget this human experiment 
ever happened. That's what I would do. Because we're just not worth it, I would think, when you turn the news on. Or maybe when you look in your own heart. But that's not what he does. You see what God does? Then I will purify the lips of the peoples that all of them may call on the name of the Lord. I'm pretty sure this is one of the passages that has the most times ever where the first person I for God, I will do this, I will do this, I will. And the things that God says he will do are all good. I will purify, I will rescue, I will save, I will take your punishment. Why on earth would he bother? You've just heard what we're like. You've just looked into your own heart, you know what you're like. Why does God do this? Why does God purify? Why does God save? And what Zephaniah 3 is supposed to be about is those who do not see the depth of despair of what it means to be human will very rarely see the gift of grace that it means to have a saviour. It's like when Jesus says, he who loves little continues to love little. In other words, once you see who you really are, then you can accurately see who God really is. God says at the exact point where I have no hope, no hope at all, I can't purify anything. To use the old vernacular where we used to use this word, you are a dirty person. We used to use that in a very nasty sense, didn't we? But it, because it comes from the Levitical word for uncleanness, which where we get the word defiled from. You are dirty, which means you can't be in God's presence. It's not a physical dirt. It's a relational dirt and baggage brought on by your sinful heart. The word that we have translated in our text is defiled. You are defiled. Now, defilement means you cannot worship God. You can't be in his presence. And it naturally is an akin to the word rebellion, And both of those need to be done away with by God in order for us to come into his presence. Without them, you are stuck in verse 8. But you need to see yourself in verse 8. As Rob started, we aren't nice people waiting for a nice God to treat me nicely. We are rebellious people, dirty people, waiting for a God to purify us and to take our punishment from us. And that's what we see in Zephaniah 3. Now, I could have chosen uh, 100 passages, but I just chose my favourites. Titus chapter 2. Hopefully, you can see that on our screen there. He talks about purification. Purification needs to do two things, and it does it simultaneously. And you see it both in this passage that you have before you in Titus and in the one in Zephaniah. The idea is is very simple. The grace of God, the eye of God, he will do something about our inability to worship him. And not only will he do that to bring us into his presence by this ritual cleansing through the blood of Jesus, he'll also then give us of his spirit to do the second part, to say no to ungodliness. So the blood of Christ both cleanses, removes the dirt, the grime, the relational baggage, that he himself has in verse 9 here. And it then teaches us to do something. In Titus 2, it's about saying no to ungodliness. In chapter 3 of Zephaniah 3, it teaches us to call on the name of the Lord, verse 9. It teaches us to serve God with one another. Previously, I was an oppressor, chapter 3, verse 1. I was a person who looked after numero uno, self. But now as God purifies me from that stupid ill where I treat myself better than anybody else on the planet and think that you should treat me the be- as well, you just treat yourself the same way, God says that has to be purified and replaced with an ability to serve him shoulder to shoulder, that's like with one another. And then verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Cush, which is a, uh, a saying really in the Old Testament to say from the furthest reaches of the uh, known world, so beyond the, the uh, Nile River, my worshippers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. So in the Old Testament, the four things that a person who is defiled can't do, 
They can't call on the name of the Lord. They cannot serve the Lord. They cannot worship the Lord, nor can they bring an offering because you're just a dirty person. Religiously, relationally defiled. That is who I am. And God must do something about it before I ever can come into his presence. And God says, I have done something about it. Which is Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But what's he done before that happens? Who gave himself for us to redeem us from more wickedness. More of that coming up in a minute in verse 15. But this is what he's done in verses 9 and 10. To purify for himself a people that are his very own. We are God's people, but we only can become God's people by accepting the purification for sins wrought by Jesus Christ. In him is that truth. And when he purifies you, he just doesn't leave you in that state. He also then gives you the strength to live godly lives, which in Zephaniah is verse 13. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue would not be found on their mouths. They will eat and lie down. No one will make them afraid. So not only are we cleansed and therefore can now worship in God's presence because where God's spirit is we are allowed to be and if you're a Christian the spirit of God lives in you and therefore you're allowed to be in God's presence because you have his spirit if you don't have his spirit you can't be in his presence because you're still defiled the spirit of God removes defilement as you understand what Christ has done for you not only does it remove your inability to be in God's presence it now enables you to do the things God will have you do. Like tell the truth, verse 13. Not be afraid to serve with one another, in verse 9. And to worship with others, in verse 10. But that's not all. Verse 15 also needs to happen. The Lord has taken away your punishment. There must be justice. He can't let you off scot-free. He just doesn't say, I'm going to send my son to die for you and the blood of Jesus is like a fire hose that just spreads across all humanity. You're all okay. You're all going to be cleansed by virtue of the power of Jesus' blood. You don't need to do anything. Just let Jesus do the lot. You know, the old Jesus take the wheel type approach. He'll do it. You do nothing. That's not what happens. He cleanses you in order for you to do something, which is to live righteous and holy lives. But there's also another thing you realise he has done. The Lord has taken away your punishment. And his question will be, will you avail yourself of that? The Lord has done it. He's done it. But will you take it? And we know that that only comes through Jesus. It is him who bore our punishment. He has borne it. But one thing that I think we all need a bit of help in, or certainly I do, given half a chance, I think most Aussies can be cynical, a bit morose, a bit sad, a bit, a bit upset about everything. And God says, well, you know what? There's enough things in the world to be upset about. What are the things that you should be joyful about? How about trying to be joyful about verse 14? Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. Why? The Lord has taken away your punishment, verse 15. So the outcome of God showing us that he is for us, he loves us, he saves us, is that we should be joyful in what God has done. Now, given half a chance, we all can be as cynical as the next bunch, morose and sad and a bit depressive, because just turn the evening news on, go to your internet, look at your own heart. But God says, flip your eyes from yourself and flip it up, in this case, to the temple, to verse 14, but flip it to Jesus. Look to him. Look to him and be joyful. And we know that's how the New Testament uses joy. Like in Philippians there, as you see. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Why? Some of you can finish the verse. The Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord. Sometimes, like when Zephaniah's people are going to be ransacked 
and sent into exile just a few decades later, it's the only thing you have to rejoice in. You may have lost everything. If you're a person living in Gaza or Israel, Ukraine or parts of southern Russia, you have nothing to rejoice in. The only thing you may rejoice in is the fact that the Lord has taken away your punishment. The Lord is for you. Who can be against you? Well, every other person on the face of the planet sometimes. But the Lord is for you. Therefore, you have one thing to rejoice in. And that joy can never be taken away. But as we end, we haven't looked at very quickly the last couple of verses. As you can see there, they continue on. What on earth are you saved for? You could have a system, and certainly the Old Testament saints believe this at various points of their history, that there was no afterlife, there was just now. So God saves you from the judgment of the now, saves you from living a life that's hopeless now, saves you from making stupid decisions now. But personally, if that is all there is to what God does, just to be cynical for a moment, this world ain't good enough if this world's salvation is all there was. There's too much pain and suffering and not enough Christians in it that if we're only saved from making stupid decisions today, I'm rescued from my past, I'm rescued from my shame and depression, I'm rescued from my sense of self and identity and I can now live the rest of my life for God. If that's all there is to it, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, count me out. We're more to be pitied than anybody else. If there aren't verses 16 and onwards, then I think Jesus has died for not much. Yes, he has purified me. Yes, he has taken my punishment. What? So that when I die and fall off the face of the planet, I just go into the ground and that's it? Good night, nurse, all over Irene. Is that what happens? Well, I think not. And the phrase, on that day, throughout a lot of the later prophets, came to refer to two things simultaneously. It refers to on that day where God does something in your life, in verse 16. But secondly, it refers to on that day that you're still looking forward to, a future that you're still wanting to see. So the movement then becomes... We are purified from this sinful world where I can now worship God. I can love him because I see that he loves me. The punishment that I deserve, verse 15, is placed on Jesus, verse 15. I can now shout aloud and sing and rejoice like it says there in Romans 15 and Philippians 4. Why? Because the end is not the end. On that day, verse 16, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion, do not... Let your hands hang limp. In other words, when judgment comes upon you and they're about to die, of, of which thousands, 100,000 died in 586. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior saves. He didn't save them physically in 586. Most of them either died or got carted off. So what type of saving is he talking about? Let's continue. He will take great delight in you, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over with you with singing. The Lord is joyful. He can't be joyful that you're dead. He can't be joyful that it's all over for Israel. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals. And you might want to say, when God, we're being carted off, which is a burden and a reproach for you at that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I would rather you deal with them right now, thanks. Actually, God, can you deal with those who oppress me before they oppress me? Why wait till after? Don't you want to know that? Why does he wait till the long game? Well, the answer obviously is there is one. The end is not the end. Even if you are oppressed to the point of death, of which at least 100,000 were, I will rescue the lame, I will gather the exiles. You know why you have to rescue the lame? Because... The lame aren't walking the 1,100 kilometres from Jerusalem to Assyria or Nineveh or Babylon. What's happening to them? They're not making it. They don't leave. So he's talking about a spiritual, a spiritual rescuing 
I will gather the exile. I will give them praise and honour in every land where they have suffered shame. In other words, this injustice of this world is not the end. Verse 20, I will gather. At that time, I will gather you. And at that time, I will bring you home. Now, initially, that meant roughly 516 when they thought they were coming home. But of course, we know that it means a whole different type of home. That the home that they're talking about is not the home of Jerusalem, not the home of St. Mary's. It's the hope of a future home. And for some of you who have lost husbands, mothers and fathers and children, if this reality of a future home where God will give you honour and praise and restore you and rescue you and save you, if there was not that home, there is no hope. The future hope is not merely that you'll be a better boy on this planet because most of us may struggle with that reality. Some of you may become more godly. Praise the Lord for that. But for those of us who go up and down like a roller coaster and we just hope that we end up dying when we're at the top of the roller coaster, not the bottom, what nonsense that must be. What nonsense it is. There is a future home that God has prepared for us. And again, we could have chosen thousands of examples. But I do like the one Peter example. Now Hebrews 13 gives the same idea. For we do not have an enduring city. St Mary's is not enduring, Sydney's not enduring, Jerusalem's not enduring, even the oldest continually occupied city on the planet, which I think is Damascus, that's not enduring either. What is enduring? We are looking for the city that is to come, the heavenly city that is our home. As these amazing verses that we end with start within 1 Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, if there was no hope, full stop. No need for verse 4. But because this is not the end, the resurrection of Jesus doesn't merely give us life today. We have future life. We have a home to go to. Therefore, verse 4, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So the movement from 9 through to 20, hopefully you can see, is pretty simple. God has enabled you to worship him by removing from you the cause of your defilement. He has now also removed from you the cause of the justice, which is the punishment was placed upon Jesus, not upon you. And so he saved us from that plight now. But not just to live in this world, but for a future world where he'll save and rescue in order to take you home. So he's saying, friends, look for the future world. If you're a Christian here today, your job is simple. To serve one another shoulder to shoulder. Remind people that their defilement is taken away. Remind them that the punishment is placed upon Christ, not upon you. But we have a future home, a real home called heaven where that person that you loved 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, who was a believer, you'll one day see again. Rejoice, there is a home on which all those who departed in Christ will one day say, Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the ending to Zephaniah. It was not at verse 8. But it is at verse 20. I pray all of us here who are believers look forward to that future home where all those have been forgiven, all those have been purified, all those have been saved, not by us, but by God. I rescue the lame, I gather the exiles, I will give them praise and honour. I will give you honour and praise. God does that. So we are thankful for what God has done. In Jesus' name we pray all things. Amen.